<laughs> he would go to an actress, say, a known actress, and say, look, um, I'm making this film. It's a perfect part for you, but I need, you know, $10,000. Can you invest your $10,000 into the film? And then she said, yes. And you'll be the star. And you'll be the star. That still goes on today. But get this, the film comes out and everything, he has no money because he's spent everywhere and he couldn't pay her back or anything. So this went on. He was arrested two or three times over the years for a fraudulent kind of raising of money. Come on, stick him up. Hi, I'm Rob Word. Welcome to our show. We are talking today with Mark Wanamaker, who has a podcast called The History of Hollywood with Mark Wanamaker, and he's right here. Mark, welcome. I'm very pleased to be here. Well, I'm happy you're here, too, because every time we get together, you amaze me with the depth of your knowledge about such obscure films from Poverty Row, and that's what we're going to be talking about today. I'm so glad you're here. I'm really pleased because I really want to talk about Poverty Row. And people always ask me, what is that? What's Poverty Row, Hollywood? That is really the very beginnings of the film industry in Los Angeles is Poverty Row. What does that mean? That means cheap made films, Poverty <laughs> Row. What does Row mean? One studio after another. And where were they located? And they were located at Gower and Sunset Street, which was later became Columbia Studios. But let's go back a little bit. Jack Perrin, mm -hmm. nobody's heard of him. Stunt rodeo actor and all this. He did everything. He did a lot, starred in a lot of movies because I've seen many the movies. posters of yes. his films. Jack Perrin and then um, Jay Wilsey. Nobody's heard of him. Fred Hume. Fred Hume. Who actually did some pretty good ones God. that were directed by William Wyler, directed the Fred Hume film. Fred Church. Uh -huh. Frank Church. Is it Fred Church or Frank Church? Frank Church, I think. <laughs> right? And, then, yeah. and there's others like this leading to two of them. Kit Carson, taken from the name, and also William Barrymore. So uh, Was he related to John Barrymore? No, he wasn't. And that's when we're going to get into now the quintessential Poverty Row director, <laughs> producer, uh, Robert Horner. Oh, I, I want to know all about him. This, for those of you who don't know about Robert Horner, and I'm sure that's 99.9% .9 of you, this is a director who makes Victor Adamson, and we've shown one of his films, look competent. <laughs> and he had a few physical yeah. issues, but we're going to find out all about them yes. from Mark. Yes. Now, Robert Horner, in, in 1920s and 20s, he wrote, he wrote things, and uh, he was like a writer, but aspired to be a producer and direct and all of this, except he had a, a little problem. He was born without legs and only had one eye. That kind of would put a hamper on his uh, rise to the top of the directing game. And the amazing thing is, is that uh, I didn't know who he was. Nobody knows who he mm -hmm. was. Mm -hmm. A couple friends of ours, mutual friend of ours, said, oh, um, I showed him a picture, a group shot of Jack Perrin, we just mentioned him. This was the beginning of sound. So it was 1929. Mm -hmm. Shows uh, Jack Perrin standing there, out on location like Lone Pine, somewhere like this. And it shows the director on the ground and some indie, fake Indians around him and the whole staff. And he had um, Jules Kronjager, who was a famous cameraman. They're all standing, all smiling, hugging each other, all this. So I show this to my friend, Richard. And he said, oh, that looks like Robert Horner. Well, who's that? Did you notice that he's like half buried in the ground? <laughs> I look at it, and he is. His waist is on the ground. Where's his legs? And then my, Richard said, he doesn't have legs. And already I had to find out who this man was who produced like 100 B Westerns from 1921 all the way up to 1934 and five using all these actors I was just telling you, Wally Wales, that's another mm -hmm, one. Mm -hmm. And this, so he invented the, the, this kind of William Barrymore. Who was William Barrymore? We'll get back to Horner in a minute because the William Barrymore is, is perfect tie-in to Horner himself. William Barrymore, his name was Ilyan Bullock, Russian. He was a Cossack in the white army of the Tsar. 
at the revolution, 1917 and all, there the, was a war, a civil war going on. The White Army lost, the Bolsheviks won. He was captured by the Bolsheviks. His unit was a cavalry unit. They were all executed except him. He was an officer. He was a young man, he was like 20. So that's why they didn't execute him? That's right, right but they were, they were going to. Mm. So they gave him a little can of beans and he ate the beans but he took the top off the can and he sharpened it. And when they came to take him, he grabbed a guard, cut his throat, ran away, somehow escaped to China, to New York, to the Russian community. And there they asked him pretty much, like, what can you do? I'm a soldier. What can I do? I can shoot, I can ride. Hollywood is for you. <laughs> it's Where does he end up? <laughs> to Hollywood, to the Poverty Row Studios, 1924, I think, when he started, 25. And Horner found him. And Horner's the one who changed his name? Of to course. Barrymore? Wow. And why Barrymore? Barrymore. The name Barrymore. That's all the press needed. <laughs> they were publicity men, these guys, these producers. Uh, Joe Rock, who was one of them I mentioned, produced a whole bunch of films, comedies. He produced them out of Poverty Row, which is Sunset Gower, Beachwood Drive, out of an office with a, a little desk, a, a telephone, and a chair. That's it. <laughs> That's Poverty Row. That's what Horner probably did. Now, Horner, because he was born without legs and all, he had to adapt. So he invented a special little wagon, electrified at the time. We're talking in the teens. Oh. And he would sit in it and would go around like they do today. Like you see handicapped people going in these little things. He invented this kind of thing. And then when he went on location, he couldn't have it. They made him a little wagon, and the men would pick him up and put him in, and then pull him around the set in Lone Pine or wherever they are. There is no excuse if you want to be a producer. <laughs> now, you ask the question, the distribution. How did he get money? Where would you show such films? Horribly made, of course, horrible acting. It doesn't matter. Quit stalling. You've been sitting around here all night. But I, I just had to rest. Yeah? So I noticed. You've been hanging around that prospector all evening. But he's only been here a few days. Yeah? I noticed he'd only been here a few days. That's why we give the regulars a break. Now go ahead and grab yourself a cash customer. But I... I... Oh. So they're not in your class, eh? Now get busy before I forget that you're a woman. Now, just a minute, Hank. The public wanted this in the tiny towns. So they went to independent little companies that would go to the theater owner. The theater owner would book it in advance, give them cash in advance. And they would get there, make the posters, and then get Horner to make, get the footage get the reels to them, and they would run it and, sh and they would transfer these reels all over the United States mm -hmm. until the reels were worn out. He'd make another and another and another. <laughs> now, they made a little money, but his thing was, God, I have to write a script about him. You he do. Would, <laughs> he would go to an actress, say, a, a known actress, and say, look, um, I'm making this film. It's a perfect part for you, but I need you know, $10,000 can you invest your $10,000 into the film? And then she said, yes. And you'll be the star. And you'll be the star. That still goes on today. But get this, the film comes out and everything, he has no money because he spent everywhere and he couldn't pay her back or anything. So this went on, he was arrested two or three times over the years for a fraudulent kind of raising of money. Now these companies called A1 Capital, and then later, we know Monogram, Chesterfield, these came later. But they have all these other little companies. But when he, was the ones. when he was arrested, <clears throat> is, they let him go because they felt sorry for he him? He went to court, and they said, what assets do you have? I have these two films. So they confiscate the films, and he's back to work again. <laughs> I mean, telling you, this is Poverty Row like Poverty Road is. So William Barrymore is a classic who's turned into a cowboy, but the William Barrymore name didn't do well, so they decided he'll, they'll star him as Kit Carson and do some Kit Carson westerns. <laughs> so this Russian Cossack becomes Kit Carson. All silent still, these are silent These are silent, movies. but then he went into sound, like the Jack Perrin one I was telling mm -hmm. you about. They went into sound and they were doing the sound. So when you ask about the techn technological issues, uh, many critics who hated Horner, 
they didn't, they hated his work. How can you hate him? Mm -hmm. Everybody loved Horner. That's they must why have, they must Jack have. Perrin was owed money. Obviously, he let it slide because I have Jack Perrin in 1920s into the 30s. So obviously, if he wasn't paid here, he's still working there. I don't know why he did this. Because nobody else was letting him star in movies. <laughs> Uh, That's maybe, one but Universal used Jack Perrin, but, mm. but they all floated around, including Art A. Court, who was mm -hmm. at Universal, and he floated around here later. Remember, he was from the Bison Company, mm -hmm. went well, to Universal. Well, Art blah, had blah, blah, done blah. well in the 20s. Yes, though. yes, he did. So we have all of the. Then Tom Mix comes out of the really the Wild West shows. The and all 101 kind of that you mentioned. Uh, that yes, was 101, some... the Miller Brothers out of Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. And um, they came in, but Tom Mix was different. He's one of the earliest ones. Now, Bronco Billy, let's get, just go back, because he's a, one of the next ones. In 19, um, it was 1908, 1909, around the same time of Bison, around this time, he formed the SNA Film Company. Mm -hmm. And um, he started to act in them as the star, but his clothing, he was a frumpy kind of guy. He was, you know, heavyweight, like a boxer, wrestler. And he wasn't very pretty, it didn't matter. He was a hero to people. Mm -hmm. Remember, most of the people in the United States looked like him. <laughs> they, didn't, they were not pretty, you see. So anyway, um, he was doing this for quite a while. And then people like Tom Mix, who went to the Selig Film Company, Colonel Selig, who uh, picked him up. And then, but Tom Mix had a, how can I say, a grace to him. Mm -hmm. He was a real performer, and a showman. And he looked better. He looked better, but he was a showman, but he was a, a, a serious writer mm -hmm. and all this kind of thing. Now, people like Harry Carey was a stage actor. Mm -hmm. He learned to be a Westerner. Mm -hmm. The difference between Harry Carey, who was a stage actor and learning to be a Western star, he had the director, John Ford, learning his craft, and that made all the difference, whereas Art Accord and Jack Perrin, they had uh, Horner. <laughs> and what a difference it makes. You know, I, I think it would have made a difference if they would have had a John Ford type. Mm -hmm. I bet you they, they could have molded them. Mm -hmm. Except Sammy Bow's voice, you know, I mean, that, that wouldn't work, no, you know. No. But, uh, but in, in the silent films, yes. No, I think they could work them. I, mm -hmm. You need a good director and all this thing. Well, uh, when sound came in, because it was so important to the films, what was the audio like in these early films? <laughs> good question. Uh, it was known that, um, first of all, that um, Robert did not know much and didn't care to know much about sound. He hired people like Jules Kroniger, the cameraman, who was an absolute excellent cameraman way back in the early silent era. And the sound men, they hired a company. There were a bunch of companies now that have a sound truck. And they go out there and they, they work with Jules and they make sure. But he didn't understand the, the, the highs and lows. So when an actor was speaking, maybe, he was a little bit too far from the mic couldn't understand, and mm -hmm. then all of a sudden he turned and bang! Where is this stuff? Well, I haven't got it. Ah, come clean. What did you do with it? Why, Ruth, what are you doing up so late? Oh, I'm so glad you're here, Bill. My brother's in another jam. Ah, cut out the bluff. This isn't getting us any place. Tell me what you did with the stuff or I'll break your neck. What'd you do with it? I tell you, I don't know. You don't know, huh? <laughs> You know, it, it was uneven, but then again... Did I have they to, loop any of these early films, or they just didn't have the budget to do that? They didn't have the money that. or budget to do that. Mm -hmm. I, I doubt it. Mm -hmm. uh, it. Later on, yes, P, uh, companies like Monogram and Chesterfield, mm -hmm. the later, you know, the, sure. the mascots and all, of course, became modern, mm -hmm. the excellent technique of making everything. But in these days, this was so crude. And, of course, this was the pioneering of the pioneering days of making these films. With Horner finding non-actors for the roles, mm -hmm. wouldn't that turn the audience off? He did find actors though. That's why he made these deals, mm -hmm. you know, with an actress who was already known, not a big star, let's mm -hmm. not go there, minor actors, and, and he would get them to invest in the film. And that's how they were in the film. <laughs> and uh, so there were a few names. If you look in the films, you'll see a lot of character actors that, that were there. I, I'd love to have interviewed them to know what they thought of working for him. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But apparently, I don't know if they felt sorry for him. I don't know, but apparently he seemed to have a nice personality. Because he must he have seemed to, con to, get... to con people into yes, all of this. Yes, he did. So as, as the, the talkies were going through and he was probably finding it harder and harder to raise money because the films were costing more right. as the 30s progressed, what happened to him? In 1934, he went bankrupt, okay? 
So, was it the first time he went bankrupt? No, probably other, oh, but, that, okay. but this was one that I read about that just, it seemed to end, but all of a sudden, 1935, he finds Awan, which was a former d a distributor for him, took another chance on him, and did <laughs> two more, and then it ended. He oh. died in 19, uh, oh God, when did he die? I forgot, but, but he was only about 48 years old mm -hmm. when he died, mm -hmm. something like that. Kind of was he born legless and with only one eye? It seemed, there's two stories. One thought, one story said that he was in a car accident when he was a young kid and had his legs and this and that. But I think he was born this way because he adapted so well mm -hmm. in all ways and he wasn't in pain. You know, if you have your legs cut off, mm -hmm. it's, it's a terrible strain on your body. You can imagine uh, many uh, amputees, etc. I think he was born that way. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, and it didn't stop him, obviously, in this. But, but I love to use him as the example of the Poverty Row producers. I used to use Joe Rock all the time, who I knew. Mm -hmm. And Joe Rock uh, produced all kinds of comedies and westerns. But he produced the, the Stan Laurel comedies in the early 20s. And uh, he, he was an amazing guy, Joe. He started at Vitagraph in Brooklyn. How as, did you meet him? You know, well, he was a friend of Irvin Willett's. And Irvin Willett was this pioneer a director. We all know he did the first Technicolor Western, Wanderers of the Wasteland, mm -hmm. which with, I think Jack Holt was in that, mm -hmm. I think. The and, a silent one. Yes, yes. and uh, that is a lost film. Mm -hmm. And I did the estate of uh, Irvin Willett, because I knew his son, and I found his film vault in, in West Hollywood, right near the Strip. That's where Harper House was, where his home. I looked in there and I found the uh, four films he made with the Willett Film Company. Now, who was Willett? Uh, I'm, te I'm telling you, taking you off on this tangent, because it all relates to Westerns and the pioneering of, of Poverty Row in Hollywood. Doc Willett, Carl Doc Willett, his older brother, was one of the founders of Technicolor. Hmm. Okay? So they formed their own company called Willett Productions in 1919. And Willett, who did they work for? Thomas Enns. They knew William S. Hart. They knew all these people. They formed their own company and they built Harry Oliver, the first art director to win an Academy Award, a little kind of fantasy architecture kind of a studio, which is today known as the Witch's House of Beverly Hills. Mm -hmm. And he also designed the, uh, Harry Oliver designed the Vandy Camp windmills, mm -hmm. which was a famous site in Los Angeles for years. So, so Irvin Willett knew Joe Rock. They all knew each other. And I was brought in after Willett died to help secure what's in the what house. What year was that? I think it was in the late 70s, early 80s, mm -hmm. I believe. Mm -hmm. And the, the four films that you discovered? Those were the films made. Have they made. been preserved? They were, they were the negatives, the original negative, in, a, in wooden boxes. Mm -hmm. They were breathing, nitrate, mm -hmm. mint condition. Mm. And then I found Wander of the Wasteland. In color? I'm going to be the king of Hollywood. I, it was in a metal can. So <sighs> opened it up. It was ruined. Oh. It, was, it was half goo and half powder. I thought I hit it big there, oh, because among no. the film collectors and the mm -hmm. archives around the world, sure. first Technicolor Western, Paramount, mm -hmm. gone. So the ones that were saved, that could breathe. Those were at the Library of Congress. They were, made, uh, they were saved, and well, what one are can they? see them. Uh, one was called Down Home, um, and, um, and the three other titles, uh, Partners of the Tide, and a couple other ones. But they weren't Westerns. No, they were not Westerns. Mm -hmm. But Irvin Willett did Westerns, a lot of them. Mm -hmm. And over the years, for Paramount, et cetera, et cetera, there's a whole list of Westerns that he did. He's also one of the only directors of Houdini mm -hmm. in for Paramount in, in the early teens. And he's quite important character in the history of film. What is it about the early days of Hollywood and, and this group of people that... Yes. causes you to get excited and to dig deeper and deeper and deeper into the history of Hollywood. I mean, I am well-versed in all of the, the uh, history of Hollywood that we know, the creation of Universal, MGM, Paramount, and well, all the, the stars uh, and all this stuff. This and is, then I did this this is book. one of Mark's books, and you've done about 30 of these, yes. haven't you? Yeah. And they're all filled with rare photos and uh, just terrific. Well, my specialty is real history, and film history, mm -hmm. and how they intertwine like this. Yeah. And it's so interesting. I mean, we have Buffalo Bill and all these people, Tim McCoy, they were real Westerners. Yeah. Then you have stage people becoming Westerners. It is the most interesting thing, particularly 
about the history of the area, Los Angeles, its rancho history, its early Western history. Mm -hmm. I have a picture of downtown LA in 1881, I think, and there's a giant sign. It's all dirt, the downtown. Giant sign with a bullseye on it, no guns allowed downtown. <laughs> Just like in Dodge City, you uh -huh. know, you can't carry yeah. a gun. This was a true thing, yeah. but there was a big sign there. <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised it was lit at night, you wow. know. But anyway, my interest in this, because my own visiting these sets, uh, uh, visiting the old ranches, western towns, Corganville, and uh, I, I met Slim Pickens, I met all these people. I, I was a, a kind of a Hollywood kid westerner. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, when you were growing up, that's what was going on. Is the, it was the Western boom of, of television. My parents dressed me at, at three years old already in a cowboy shirt with jeans. <laughs> and then since we had connections, my father was a doctor, he met people like Tim McCoy, Ray Crash Corrigan, and all, Jay Silverheels, all these people, and I was drawn into it. Mm -hmm. and, but then my, when Walt Disney said, uh, we met Walt Disney, said, oh, we should put him in the Mickey Mouse Club. No, 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 we don't want him to be an actor. But then Walt convinced them, why doesn't he just be like around an extra? So, so I was Spin and Marty. Spin and Marty, yes. Tell, me, yeah. tell us about Spin and Marty. Rin Tin Tin. Yeah. Spin and Marty is interesting. Um, that was a, that's an offshoot, as you know, of the Mickey Mouse Club. Mm -hmm. And it's about a, a kid's dude ranch, boys. Mm -hmm. It was a girl's dude ranch with Annette Funicello well, over there. On the other there. side of the lake. They're over there. Yeah. <laughs> and um, so I remember that um, my mother used to drive me out to... Uh, I, well, I didn't know exactly where, the valley. Mm -hmm. And then I, uh, Tim Considine called me one day, years ago now, he just passed away. Yeah. Damn. And um, he said, um, this is Tim Considine, and I thought, oh, he's calling about Spinner Marty or something, <laughs> because there was a guy doing a website on it. That's how I, oh. I got into this. He says, no, I'm looking for pictures of my grandfather, John Considine. Mm -hmm. Who is John Considine? One of the pioneering film producers, mm -hmm. moguls, mm -hmm. a First National, Paramount. Why, God, of course, John Considine. That's yeah. his, you and see, it's his in his- sons, too, It's in not his just blood. Tim, but there was a John yeah. Jr., I think, yes, too. Yes, yes. So here, Tim is part of that family. Wow. wow, so I had pictures. Yeah. He was thrilled. Then I asked him the question. I said, I remember being driven out to the valley for, for Spin and Marty. Where did we go? We went to a ranch called the, oh, God, no, I can't remember, the uh, something ranch in Canoga Park. Hmm. It was a real dude ranch mm -hmm. with horses and everything, and Disney leased the whole thing. And that's where I met Adobe, you know, uh, yeah, uh, for, Harry Carey Jr., Harry Carey Jr. Sure. Adobe. I was seven already learning how to ride in Newhall. My parents sent me to a little horse ranch, seven. And I was learning how to ride. I still remember riding at seven in on Newhall Boulevard there or whatever. <laughs> this is in the 50s. Well, Mark, I can certainly see why and how you have this passion for Westerns, but the early Westerns, I don't think there's anybody who has the knowledge and the background that you do. Of course, the books again, you know, you have all these books that are specific. What, of, of these 30 books you've written, what's your favorite? Is it this one, Early Poverty Row Studios? This one is important to me mm -hmm. because of my own background, but it's also to teach people of the very beginnings of the film industry coming to Hollywood, Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. That's what this book is. Mm -hmm. It's a handbook on the history of the film industry in Los Angeles. Well, and it's filled with photos you just won't. And we're not talking about Clark Gable working in Two Out the Handle. No, this is the nitty gritty. This is how the studio started, who started them, who was there, what films they used, what locations they used. This is the beginnings. This is like a, like a good Bible. A primer. A primer mm -hmm. for learning all about the rest of the history of the film industry. Thanks again for coming by, Mark. I appreciate it, and I look forward to having many more lunches with you because every time I do, I walk away with all this knowledge of things that I have a passion for and love as well. Thank you. Thank you for letting me share this new knowledge that nobody's ever heard of yet.